I didn't. I didn't touch anything. Yeah. Sorry about this. <laughs> it's okay. Stay close. Okay. All right. Is this mic level good? Okay. I can do it. Yeah, that's okay. Passwords Con 2014, what's going on? <laughs> My name is Nate Power. I'm a pen tester researcher working on the FUFA security team over at CDW. Uh, just kind of a quick show of hands to make sure you guys are in the right presentation. Does everybody know what an OWA is? Okay. Uh, do we have any pen testers out there? We got a few. Do we have any inspiring pen testers out there? All right, cool. Well, if you don't know what an OWA is, it's actually Microsoft's Outlook Web app. Um, it's basically a remote service that allows users to be able to get email through a web interface. And the OWA actually is a service that runs on a client access server along with several other services. Well, I had pretty much done a black box app review of some of these services on the client access server and found several bugs in the system. I've been able to leverage these bugs during pen test um, that pretty much give me information about an exchange environment and its users. Yes. <laughs> Do I swipe? Okay. All right, cool. Some of the things we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about how they actually discover these client access servers on the internet. And then I'm actually going to take it a step further and talk about how to actually discover the internal IP addresses of the client access servers. I had actually discovered a method to be able to validate users without any form of authentication. Uh, I found several issues in the auto discover service that we'll be able to leverage in a pen test. Uh, then we'll talk about some things that you guys can actually do to reduce some risk in your environments. Okay, so for discovery, typically when I start a pen test, I always perform uh, DNS brute forcing just to try to discover what my customers, uh, what servers or services you might have out there on the internet. And uh, going through several of these, I had always noticed that there was this auto discoverer dot whatever the dot com is for that customer in most of my results. Well, actually digging into what the auto discoverer service does. I had found that the service is used for remote Outlook clients to be able to discover the client access server and then auto-magically be able to configure the end user's Outlook client. The steps that the uh, Outlook client's actually doing to discover the client access server, well, it's actually going to these two static URL paths and then it's doing a DNS service uh, record lookup. So I had actually taken a sample size of 500 random organizations I had uh, taken some common uh, pen tester methods for discovery, along with the static URLs and the DNS service records. Uh, I found a little bit over half of the uh, uh, organizations in my sample set, I was able to discover their mail systems on the internet. I found the static URLs to be the most common method for discovery. Uh, then, of course, DNS brute force came in second. So this is actually a pretty valid way for discovery. This is the first bug I found uh, in the OWA. It was actually against uh, OWA uh, 2010 Forefront TMG setup. I was going through initially attempting to just see if ASP.NET debug was enabled on any of the file paths that I could access. And uh, I had actually found on the OWA auth file path that it had given me a little bit different of an error message than I've seen on the other file paths to where if you see down there in the highlighted uh, user host address, it's actually giving me the internal IP address of the re reverse proxy processing request for the OWA. Uh, this isn't specific to a, a forefront proxy. I have seen it in third party proxies, but it's always been a reverse proxy. Uh, next issue I had actually found was an IIS that runs on client access server. This issue actually goes all the way back to OWA 2003. I had uh, essentially found that when you send a get re request to very specific file paths and you leave the host header empty and you're sending an HTTP 1.0 versus a 1.1 protocol request, that it reveals uh, the internal IP address of the client access server 
and uh, 302 location headers and the 401 basic realm headers. These are all the vulnerable file paths that I found. Uh, there are some several, several other more out there that I have included into the Metasploit module. And I, I know you guys are probably thinking, well, what's the big deal? It's probably, it's just an internal IP address. What, what's that matter to me? Well, the way I'm actually leveraging that on a pen test is once I actually get internal access, whether I plug into the network, maybe it's wireless or I even get onto the VPN, this is actually telling me the subnet where potentially most of the servers with sensitive information are sitting. Okay, I'm going to show you guys a demo here. Uh, if I can figure this out. Swipe. <laughs> okay, so I, I, can you guys see that okay? You coming in okay? I'm going to have to pause it here real quick. I wanted to show you guys how quick the discovery method is. I had uh, written a dumb shell script that basically goes through looking for this auto discover service out on the internet. I had included the steps that the Outlook client does, and I had uh, included some common methods here. And you can see I, I was able to just input uh, the domain name for an organization. In this case, it's example.com. And within a matter of seconds, I was able to find the client access server. Okay. Oops. Here I'm actually pulling the internal IP address of a client access server just using the OpenSSL client. In this first example here for the host header, I'm putting in whatever host name I wanted. And you can see there that it actually is revealed in the basic realm banner. And doing the OpenSSL command is the quickest and most manual way to do this. That's why I'm showing you guys. And then you can see if you leave out the host header here, The internal IP address is revealed. Pretty cool. It's okay. Okay. All right. So I was actually able, I found a method to be able to validate users through a timing attack. Uh, essentially, what I'm doing here, I'm uh, timing authentication requests to the client access server. And I've been able to determine if that account actually exists in Active Directory or not. Uh, this is all the code I'm using uh, to be able to accomplish this attack. Um, I was working at pen test gig, and as I, I was attempting to brute force an OWA 2010 uh, system, and I was actually brute forcing the EWS path. And uh, it seemed like all just eyeballing it, all my uh, authentication requests when I was attempting to brute force a single account, it was taking about 60 seconds to come back. And I had 19,000 usernames I was attempting to guess at the system and a limited amount of time on the pen test, and it was just taking me way too long. So I wanted to figure out down to the second, how long was this actually going to take me to go through all 19,000 users in my list? Well, evaluating uh, some of the time responses, I actually started to see patterns in the time responses where... Uh, uh, allowed me to actually validate the users, and I had determined that this was mainly being done because of Windows Kerberos on the back end. Uh, when you send authentication requests to the client access server, the client access server actually handles that and does the uh, communication to the domain controller. Uh, and the real issue here is actually how Windows Kerberos is staging the authentication requests uh, on the domain controller. First, it's going to come in to see if the domain actually exists. And if the domain exists, it's going to come back and see if the user is in the database. And then, of course, if the user is in the database, it's going to verify to see if the password exists. These are my test results. Uh, I had found on non-existent domains, the response times for those were coming back between two and three seconds. Uh, domains that exist, but the username doesn't exist. I found the response times actually vary between systems. Uh, but the pattern always existed in the system I was uh, evaluating. And then, of course, if the domain and the username exist, most of the time I'm actually finding these response times to come back underneath the second. And keep in mind, some of this is going to vary depending on system resources of the, uh, of the systems you're pen testing, uh, and uh, network speeds could even play a factor.
doing a time and analysis on non-existent domains. Uh, you can see here in the middle columns the username list that I'm using and attempting to brute force. On the very first request, the time came back in 2.25 seconds. Every request after that actually came back underneath the second. But continuing to let it run, it seemed like every 30 seconds, you would see the 2.25 second request again, and then it'd be 30 seconds again. So there was a pattern. Doing a timing analysis when you actually know the domain, using the same username list in the middle column there. For In this case, for accounts that didn't exist, the response times were coming back in 15 seconds. And you can see administrator guests and training were all valid accounts in the systems, and those response times came back underneath the second. These are all the vulnerable paths that I found on the client access server. Uh, Form-based authentication, basically from 2007 to 2013 is vulnerable, even if you're running, running it through a forefront TMG setup. I had found uh, st static IIS file paths uh, that support HTTP over NTLM uh, are vulnerable. And the two paths that I listed here are, have HTTP over NTLM enabled by default. Okay, so we're going to do a demo here. I'm actually going to kind of take you guys through a scenario of how I start a pen test to be able to test if the timing attack exists, and then we'll just move forward from there. Okay, so here you can see at the very top is my username list I'm using. On purpose, I'm putting in there accounts that I know for sure that they haven't set up in Active Directory. And then I had put uh, some default accounts that are in Active Directory when you install it, administrator and guest. I had modified the OA login, uh, OA login script and Metasploit uh, with the timing attack. It hasn't been submitted yet, uh, but it is available on the poopus.net blog. So you can see here in the middle column are the actual times. This account didn't exist, came back in 15 seconds. Administrator came back underneath the second. And then we had the guest account come back under a second. So we know for sure the timing attack works against this, and we're actually going against the form base off. Okay, but now that we know the timing attack exists, I'm going to go through and uh, use a username list of common accounts that I know exist. Because usually people set up common accounts and they don't put strong passwords around them. I'm attempting to guess a password to password one on these accounts. And I want to know which accounts are actually valid. It's my end game is to actually build a list of valid accounts that I know exist in the system. I'm just kind of speeding this up for you guys. It's, this process is actually multi-threadable and uh, the time responses come back the same. This is more of a proof of concept. Okay, so we can see here, we actually have an SQL service account that came back under a second. We had a training account that came back underneath the second, but we got lucky as shit, and uh, we got a successful login on that one. But you're probably thinking, well, what's the point of moving on at this point uh, when we got a successful login? We just log into the OWA, pull down the global address book, and it's game over, right? Okay. Well, attempting to log in with a training account, we end up finding that this account is just a standard domain account and it doesn't have any exchange permissions or a mailbox. So what can we do at, with it at that point? Oh, God. Well, I found some pretty cool issues in the auto discover service. I found you can actually authenticate to this server ser service if you don't have any exchange permissions. Uh, and I also found an XML SOAP parameter injection to where it actually allows me to inject an email address so I can pull auto discover configs of other users in the exchange environment. Uh, looking through the config files, there's quite a bit of loot in there that we can actually use on a pen test. And we'll go ahead and uh, step through that. Here's the actual uh, post request that gets sent to the auto discover service. Your Outlook client sends this request. The email address parameter is actually vulnerable. And if you uh, put a valid email address in this parameter, you're able to pull the configuration file for any user in exchange. 
Looking inside the auto discover config, we find things such as full names, which is kind of cute. Maybe we could use that in social engineering. Uh, we actually have exchange permissions, which is pretty interesting because anybody that's set up in exchange, they're automatically added to the exchange administrator group. And I would consider the exchange administrator group more of a container. Then there's actual objects inside that container that are giving up permissions. Uh, we find usernames in the auto discover config. If you've ever migrated your exchange, and if your company's been around for a while, I'm sure you have at some point, uh, the legacy DN information from that actually gets stored in the auto discover config. Uh, we find some more discoveries, such as things as domain controllers, uh, which is pretty interesting because going through ex enumerating uh, multiple config files, you find things like not every user authenticates to the same domain controller, um, or even going back to the exchange permissions. I, I found exchange administrators to screw up uh, the permissions so bad to where you're actually able to identify system administrators. Um, and then the config file gives you things like service path URLs and what that user has permission to access. Okay. Okay, I had written a Ruby script here that actually does the XML SOAP injection. At the very top here, I have a list of emails. Maybe I stripped them off of Google or maybe I just guessed at them. Uh, it doesn't matter because we can just throw them at the service to see what comes back. I'm actually using the training account with password one, has no exchange permissions. It extracted all the config files. And keep in mind, this is also a method for validation to see if accounts exist. This is the raw output of, uh, of the auto discover config. There you can see we had uh, discovered usernames and username formats. And having the A number uh, is pretty important because now what I can do is actually generate my own list of potential A numbers, go back using the timing attack, try to determine which ones are actually valid. Uh, and there you can see, just for flair, we pulled out the domain controllers. Okay, so at the top here is actually a list of A numbers that I generated. And now I'm going back with the timing attack, trying to determine which ones are valid because I want to add them to my list of valid users that I know exist in Active Directory. Okay, so you can see we got several valid accounts here. Okay, going back, this top list here is all the valid accounts I had uh, validated through this demonstration. We even have the SQL service account in there. This time around, I'm going back and I'm actually using a password of summer 14, which is pretty common. You guys probably know that. And look how fast this process goes because all the requests are going to come back underneath a second. Oh, shit. Back it up. My display's slow. You guys need to fix that. <laughs> okay, so we went through several accounts and they all came back in a matter of a few seconds. Uh, we got lucky, got a few successful logins, and just to kind of close out the proof of concept here. Uh, yeah, initially when I first found this, Customer was pissed. <laughs> uh, we shut down the project for about 24 hours. So it was it was a lot of accounts. Uh, yeah, and you guys, we got access to email and the worldwide address book and all that. Oh God, pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Okay, so what can we do to reduce risk? Uh, well, Microsoft had actually fixed the internal IP address reverse proxy issue in a roll-up. Uh, they were really bad about telling me what roll-up it was, uh, but I pretty much haven't seen it out in the wild for about a year. Uh, I would disable anything, basic authentication or 302 redirects on your client access servers. Uh, I think the auto-discover service is a complete piece of shit and everybody should disable it. 
Uh, Microsoft has no plans to fix that or the internal IP address issues. Uh, if you're running an ISA, Federation Services, or even Outlook.com, I have not found those vulnerable to the timing attack. Uh, it is interesting, though. I do find a lot of my customers converting over to Outlook.com, uh, but that's just for the OWA uh, form-based authentication to where they'll still run a client access server with just the auto-discover service on it. That's where I'm still able to abuse that. Uh, then lastly, you guys need to turn up your uh, default log levels on your domain controllers because those are actually only logging locked accounts. They don't uh, log failed logins. If you can come in here and actually monitor for behavior and failed logins, you'll be able to determine when a brute force attack is taking place. I, I, are you talking about the Federation service? I, I'm, Okay, a lot, a lot of times I, I, I don't know what kind of setups and configurations I'm dealing with when I'm seeing this stuff, um, just because I haven't set it up in the lab kind of thing, so, yeah, so. <laughs> okay, so for your guys' information, I just released advisories on these vulnerabilities last Friday. Uh, they can be found on our team blog or my personal blog. Uh, if you guys want access to the Metasploit module tools, they're out there on our blog. Uh, and then I have plans to release the auto discover enumeration tool. Uh, I just haven't got around to it pretty much, but I'm hoping to get accepted to DerbyCon. <laughs> and I'll release it then. Okay, questions? Okay. Well, I will be at the EFF part. Oh, question. I, I'm sorry, I was having trouble hearing him. Let me get him a mic. Yeah, 2007 and 2013. So, and Microsoft pretty much came back and said, um, the issues are too architectural. They can't create a patch to quickly fix them, and they're going to take them to consideration for future products. So, these issues are going to be around for a while, uh, and you guys will be able to use these in your pen test. So. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I will be at the FF party Thursday night. I'll probably get there first thing and hang around for an hour or two if you guys got more questions. Feel free to come up to me. Uh, I'm going to have my USB stick on it. Uh, I will have all my tools on it. If you guys want copies, just let me know. Uh, I'd like to take a uh, special thanks to these guys for supporting me in all my research. And that's all I got, guys. So. Thank <laughs> you.